What is the single determinant that says you should be in stocks? Let's clear something up. I am not a relentless <laughs> bull. There yeah. have been many times during my career where I have taken a much more bearish and cautious stance. And if you think the hate mail is interesting now, you should see that. <laughs> so, so what about the current situation? The economy is getting better. And while the stock market has improved, it has not risen as much as the economy has. And so, for example, over the last three years, since the recession ended summer 2009, GDP has increased, corporate profits have increased, and we are now seeing a momentum in the economy, which suggests that the next recession mm -hmm. is pretty far off into the future. We've got some technical questions, but I want to take you back decades. Your work with Louis Rukeyser. There's so many people that watch this show, that listen to this show, that have missed this market. It's the no one's in the market show. You look at a stock like Danaher and the, it's just a straight up move. For those people that are at the dock, how do they get back on the boat? They have to remember that the key to successful long-term investing is diversification. And one of my great concerns is not the opportunity cost of missing the equity market, but also staying too long in an asset like bonds that may in fact lose value. If the economy continues to do well, interest rates go up, we may see that bond prices go down. So that's something need, people need to keep in mind, but don't make the change all at once. We really need to see gradual adjustments in portfolio. Mm. Do you worry about the day that the Fed has to exit the market and unload some of this, the massive, the trillions of dollars in stimulus that it's built up? Everyone is worried about it and everybody is already talking about it, which is a very good thing. And clearly what we have is not just the Fed, but many people on the sidelines thinking about the ways in which this can be done in a way that's not terribly disruptive. You know, at some point in every market cycle, interest rates do rise. Um, and we think that rise here will begin some months or quarters from now. But keep in mind that inflation is quite low in the United States and that by itself should provide something of a dampening effect on the rise in rates. We had a single best chart yesterday, Abby, that talked about how a few good days make all the difference. Uh, since the bull market began, annualized returns for the S&P 500, about 20 percent. Without the three best days of every year, that goes down to 9 percent. Without the five best days of every year, it goes down to 3 percent. What does that tell you about conviction in the market? What it also tells us, other than about conviction, is something about what personal financial advice should be. And that is don't try to be a timer, don't try to be a day trader, but take an intermediate to long-term look. If equities appear to offer good value, and we think they do, 12-month price target on the S&P, 1650, and you have some longer-term concerns about bonds, you should begin to make that adjustment. But what you're pointing to in terms of this volatility of the market is something that appears even more volatile when you look up a little bit too close. The reality is that volatility measured by standard deviation of the market is back down to historic levels. That is we have come from a period where volatility was four times normal. Right. We're back to normal. So we come back to normal. We're back to the VIX that I talk about, folks, all, all the time at, at 13. How do you discern dividend growth versus being a yield hog? Where does Abby Joseph Cohn, you're with David Costin, you're sitting at a big table at Goldman Sachs with big money, and you got to sit there and go, where's that tipping point between 2.8% and 3.2%? How do you determine that? Well, it's not just what we're looking at in the aggregate market, but by individual companies. What we know from long periods of history is the stocks with the highest yields often don't give you the best return mm -hmm. because these are companies that are cash rich, but they don't have anything to invest it in. So the much better combination is companies that have some cash, can invest it, can increase the return on equity, return on invested capital, do capital. Give us expand. an example. I got to make some money here. I, I, I have not been cleared this morning <laughs> to give you specific. I'm case. shocked. <laughs> um, but, but there are plenty out there, and it's the combination of strong return on equity or return on invested capital and dividend growth, not the high yield, it's the growth in the dividend that Would matters. you stay out of the equity markets abroad in Europe, in Japan, in China? Our teams are seeing opportunities there, again, for intermediate to long-term investors. Uh, among the most interesting right now are in Asia, Japan, and Korea, both expected to have very strong profit growth this year. Um, obviously, there are some currency issues for uh, dollar-based investors. Uh, and even in Europe, our team believes that by the end of this mm -hmm. year, some of the fears will abate and they see good opportunities in selected markets including the UK. Stocks in the US have rallied Abby as 
companies resist deploying some of their record hordes of cash. Does a rising stock market influence them to use up some of that cash? I think what you were talking about before in terms of confidence building, well, it's not just consumer confidence. It's also investor confidence and the confidence of CEOs. And when they feel better about the future, they begin to pick up that spending. And we've seen mm -hmm. it. Capital spending plans in the United States are on the rise. And we think CapEx could be at double digit levels in the quarters ahead. When you look at Wall Street, reconnecting with Main Street, you've been doing this long enough to know there was a time where Main Street had this, a linkage to Wall Street. They got to get that back. How are we going to get that back? I don't want you to speak for Mr. Blankfein, but how do we get back that understanding that Wall Street has a service to America? You know, it's not just Wall Street, it's banking system, not just here in New York, but around the country. We have to understand that we're all part of the same system and that financial services companies are the intermediaries. We're the ones mm -hmm. that try to find the matching point, the meeting point between those who have capital right. and would like to invest it, those who have capital would like to save it. And obviously we need to have confidence all around.